Hey, good morning. Welcome to Discovery Church. How many excited to be in God's house today? Come on, make some noise. Awesome. So glad that you're here. And for everyone watching us online, uh, join us for this new series we started last week called Rhythm. We're two Sundays into a new year. And there's already, we're like, let's cross over well. Let's leave 2021 behind. And there's a, a lot of stuff, I believe, that you have left. There's a lot of things that we're not dragging into 2021, but my goodness. Stinking COVID just keeps like, uh, there's some things that just keep coming up, right? Like, like I've talked to so many people that are like, again, can we not have like, like I'm trying to start fresh, but the, again, just it seems like it's, it's and it's kind of cramping people's style with this new year, new year, new rhythm kind of thing. So let me just encourage you with this thought. This world might not ever change, but it is time for you to change. Okay, there are some things, look, stop hoping and waiting for it. We're hoping and waiting like for that to change. Look, this is going to be the best year of your life if you can keep in rhythm with God. If it's your best year spiritually, then don't matter what happens with COVID or politics or whatever in this world, but you can stay in rhythm walking with God, then you can have a great year. So let's not get distracted by some of the semblance of 2020 and 2021. This can still be your greatest year if you stay focused and you stay in rhythm. And that's why we're doing this series. It's actually our Word for the year is rhythm so that you can keep this focus and keep this stride walking with God. I talked to you last week about how much easier it is when you're in rhythm, how just it, your life flows, it, it moves, it almost is without thinking when you're in rhythm, when you have the rhythm, you're just in beat and it's, it's, it's easy. It doesn't take a lot of energy or focus to be in rhythm when you catch it, you're just you just move with it. And then contrastly, when you're out of rhythm, how it just takes so much energy, it takes so much focus, it just, you're, you feel like it's a, it, it's a grind. And for a lot of people, maybe your Christianity exhausts you. Some people have tried Christianity, you're, you're trying faith, you're trying church, and it's like exhausting or draining energy from you. That's a sure sign that you're practicing a religion and you're not establishing a relationship. Because Christianity is not. It's not a religion. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Your walk with the Lord should not drain you. It should not take energy from you. In fact, it should add strength and vitality and energy and invigorate your life. That's what your walk with Jesus is supposed to do. So when I think that me serving God is all up to me, I've begun working for him instead of walking with him. I mean, there's a lot of people who are trying to work for Jesus, do good, be good, and make the right choices when I think we're missing it. There's a big difference between that. When I, if I'm not walking with Christ, my spirit becomes dry and brittle. See, it's not, it's, it's not a religion, it's a relationship. It's not a list of rules to follow. It's a rhythm to live by. And so this year, we're going to focus on some rhythms. And I'm giving you six of them in this series, six rhythms this, that Jesus modeled for us, he invited us into this new lifestyle, a new pace that doesn't look like this world at all. In fact, it's very counter-cultural. In fact, the, two, the first two messages in this series, last week and today, are extremely counter-cultural. It's honestly not the topics that, that you should preach if you want to grow a church or something like that. This is like, but I'm not, I'm not interested in growing the church. I'm interested in growing you. I want, and if you grow... And if you can walk with Christ and you are growing, then I believe that God's kingdom will grow, will grow with it. So I know this doesn't make sense for me to be talking about the things I'm talking about the first two Sundays. But, but I believe this can change your life. That these first two messages uh, of this rhythm series are so key and instrumental to your rhythm. To what Jesus invited us into the life that Jesus invited us into. In fact, these two, it all hinge it on these first two weeks' messages. Let me show it to you again in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30. This is going to be like our theme verse. We're going to kind of read this every week together, okay? It says, are, Jesus is speaking here. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Well, come to me, he says. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. Jesus invites is inviting us into this, a recovery of a life that, like, for a lot of people, our life is missing something. Like, we're, 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 
our days turn into weeks, our weeks turn into months, months turn into another year, and Jesus is going, look, man, I want you to recover. You're missing something. You might be existing, but you don't know life. I'm going to invite you to recover some of the time that's being wasted, your energy, your life, your years being wasted. Come, and I'll help you recover your life. And then immediately he tells us, and this is what we're going to talk about today. He says, I'll show you how to take a real rest. I'll show you how to take a real rest rest walk with me and work with me watch how i do it learn the unforced rhythms of grace isn't that beautiful this unforced relationship with the father with god that that jesus modeled that was so attractive to so many people even to this day it's attractive to so many of us jesus relationship with the father an unforced relationship a rhythm really is what it looks like I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, which is why a lot of people say they don't go to church. No, it's just too, too, no, no, you're missing the point. You're totally missing the point here. It's not about rules. It's about a relationship. He says, I'm not going to lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. So last Sunday, we started off the new year with part one of our rhythm series, and we talked about the rhythm of prayer and fasting. An essential, like this is, it's a key to you staying in rhythm this year is you not just knowing about prayer and fasting, you thinking it's a good idea, Christians should do it, and you think that's a good, but, but you actually creating a rhythm yourself where you are praying and fasting. It's why last week we began our year with 21 days of prayer and fasting, and I'm so excited about what this is going to do in your life. If you're kind of, if you didn't get that message, go back and listen to it. We talk about that last week, um, but if you haven't started maybe fasting, go back and check that out. You can start with us this week. If you did start with us and you stopped along the way, you can pick it back up. It's okay. Don't stop. Just keep going. Let's just keep going and get closer to Jesus this year and further away from the world. So part one, a rhythm of prayer and fasting. Today, again, these two key components to the rhythm, and I know they're not, it's not a popular topic. In fact, you're going to go... What in the world is that? Okay, here, here's the second rhythm that Jesus is inviting us into. It's a rhythm of silence and solitude. Say what now? Silence and solitude, to which all the husbands are like, yes, Lord. I do this one very good. <laughs> this is, no, 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 no. That's not, it's not that kind of silence and, and solitude, okay? This is a lost, for a lot, for, for, for a lot of people, a lost art, man, the lost discipline of of Christianity. This is something that Jesus modeled. Jesus modeled this for the disciples. The disciples carry this lifestyle of entering these places of silence and solitude. And the early church in Acts and throughout the early church movement of our fathers of faith, they had practices and rhythms of silence and solitude. So much that some of them would say that, that early theologians said that you cannot be an effective disciple of Jesus without entering the place of silence and solitude. And for a lot of people, we, don't, we just don't practice it. But we see it modeled throughout Jesus. So Jesus is saying, look, are you burnt out? Are you worn out? Come to me, and I'll show you how to take a real rest. He modeled this, this lifestyle for us. In fact, all throughout the scriptures and the gospels, you see Jesus going to a place of silence and solitude. Some of you, in fact, all throughout the gospels, I think there's a slide up here. It's not in your notes. But um, all over the gospels. You see, when Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew to a boat privately to a solitary place. Mark 135 says again, solitary place. And in Mark 632, they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary, a lonely place. He was by himself. Every time we see this phrase used in the Gospels, it's actually a Greek word. The Greek word is eremos. Eremos. That Jesus withdrew to a place of eremos, a place of silence. And solitary. Some of your translations actually translate it uniquely. You might, you might see the translation wilderness or desert or even the wild, it might say. And the reason is because that word, and animals, means that it is a deserted place, an uninhabited place, an uncultivated place, a barren place, a place without any, you know, human settlement at all so it would be the wild or the wilderness some of the translations but literally it wasn't just a geographical place that jesus withdrew himself to get alone with god in a place of silence and solitude and if this year you are going to walk with him you need to understand that he is inviting you into his rest 
that yes, prayer and fasting, let's, let's be a year where we're focusing in, man. We're going to create a rhythm of prayer and fasting. But we need to recover this lost discipline of Christianity, this lost discipline and rhythm that Jesus modeled for us, a rhythm of rest, a rhythm of silence and solitude. For most people, our lives are lived very superficially, if we're honest. Like, I think that, that to, we kind of don't go to the place of depths of our soul, of our thoughts. Of, in fact, it looks like an iceberg. You guys may have seen this, this illustration before. Our lives are kind of like an iceberg. An iceberg, they say up to 90% of an iceberg is actually underneath the surface of the water. That just 10% of the iceberg is what you can see. And so for a lot of us, what we can, we're, the 10% that we can see is what I'm looking at right now. It's you walking around, it's you talking, it's what you project to people, it's the clothes that you put on, it's the car that you drive. It's, but it's, there's so much more to you than what I can see about you. There is so much more. There is a depth of you underneath the surface of the water. There is so much more. This is where your past lives. Your hurts live. Your memories live. Your triggers live. Your wounds are here. But not just that. This is where the voice of God is. Your purpose. Your dreams. His vision. This is that place in the depths. You see, deep is the dwelling place of God. This is where God dwells. Many of us are comfortable above the surface. We don't want to dive into the depth of our history, of our memories, of our pain. And because of that, we're not experiencing the voice of God. Because he dwells in the deep. And we're up here, superficial relationships, superficial Christianity going through emotion, but never really walking with him. Going to, attend, going to church or going to things and even doing good things, but never really walking with and hearing Jesus. I believe that every human being like yearns for that. We, we want healing. We want to be known, truly known. Not just that part of me, not just this, this, this superficial part, but my soul, and my, my mistakes, my past, my, my purpose, my dreams. Like we, we yearn, but our lives are so distracted and so busy. See, our hearts yearn for an antidote to the busyness of our lives. That's what I believe. That it, I, every one of us, we, like, we desire, we know that something is off, that there's more to this life, that there's even more to us. There's more of God that I'm not hearing, that I'm not catching, and we're yearning for an antidote to the distraction and the, the busyness inside of our lives. We yearn for the invitation that Jesus gave to recover your life. To recover it. To learn a rhythm of rest. The silence and solitude. Look at Ephesians chapter 2 um, up here in your notes with me. Verse 4 through 6. Look what it says. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love, with which he loved us even when we were dead in our trespasses. Isn't that good news, you guys? That God loved you even when you were like going the wrong direction, when you were messed up and messing other people up, that God still loves you right there in that place. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together, look at this, and made us sit together in heavenly places. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, sit down. Turn to the other one and say, I am seated. There you go. Do you know what it means to do you know what it means to sit? What do you do? What, what do people do when they sit? They rest. That's what you do. When people sit, they they to be seated in heavenly places with Jesus is to enter inner rest. It's to enter a place of rest. He, this is the key to having an abundant life in Christ. It's 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 living by God's grace through faith because grace is God's power working in us, enabling us to do what God has called us to do, not out of our effort or strength, but from this place of grace, from a place of rest. It's a place of rest. In fact, this is like to be, everything, everything operates this way. Like, you, Let me say it like this. You have to learn how to sit in God 
before you walk with God. You have to be able, you have to learn how to sit in Christ before you walk with Christ so you can run your race. Right? This, this, is, this is like just natural, uh, everything follows this, this methodology. You came into the world not able to sit or run. You came under the, in fact, this is how you came into the world. Every baby, right? Here. Okay, this is how you came in the world as a baby. You could do nothing, good for nothing baby. You look cute, but and, and this, is how you, this is how you come into Christ, by the way. You come into Christ like this. I'm done. I'm just done. I can't do it, God. I can't do it. Okay, which, by the way, you need to, you got to come to this place of just, oh, dang it, I'm done. I'm just done. I can't do it anymore. I'm just, that is what salvation is. It's this, it looks like this. Oh, God, help me. So you came into Christ like this, you came into the world like this. Now, what if I were to try to stand up without entering into rest, without sitting or kneeling? <laughs> can't do that, can you? You can't do it. So, so in order for me to, to, in, it, to stand in Christ, and there's a lot about standing, Stand strong in the Lord. Stand firm. Stand against the enemy. There's a lot about standing. I need to stand. But in order to stand, I got to do what? Oh, I got to sit. I got to, I got to, and, and I can only stand from the vantage point of having sat in rest. And by the way, anytime that you, anytime you fall, you have to go back to the place of rest in order to stand up again. I'm not saying you can't serve, can't make a difference, you can't like help people, but I'm saying in inner rest, you can't just go back to running again. When I fall down, I can't just go back to standing. I got to enter rest. I got to enter this place of grace, not by my strength. I got to, so, so here, let me get, this is the theology of rest. I'm sorry, I got to get teachy with you guys. I'm all sitting down. I'm going to stay here for a moment, okay? <laughs> so um, Jesus, when he was baptized by John the Baptist, you see the whole trinity show up, right? Beautiful moment, the, the dove, the Holy Spirit descending, God's voice, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased, Jesus the son coming out of the water. Immediately after that moment, you would think that's the moment of, his ministry is starting, officially starting. That, that's the moment he's got audience, the voice of God, the Holy Spirit coming. Now preach the word, Jesus, here it is. The Bible says, that immediately after he was baptized, he was led by the Spirit into Eremos, into the wilderness, a place of solitary silence, of solitude. Isn't that interesting? The moment that, I mean, he was meant for this. He was meant to go preach good news. And he didn't start that way. He, he started by sitting. Go back to the Old Testament in, uh, in Genesis when Adam was created on the sixth day. God created Adam on the sixth day. And the Bible says he was given dominion over everything on the earth. And then the seventh day. And God rested from his work. So the first thing that Adam was charged with doing was not dominion. He was created, and here you go, here's dominion, here's what I've called you to do. And what does he do? He sits. This is, I'm telling you, this is, this is the theology of rest that you see all throughout the scripture, that you cannot walk with God or run your race until you learn how to sit in his grace. Come on, somebody give God some praise while I get up. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. Verses 9 through 11 says this, There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works. We'll talk about the Sabbath rest in a moment. I'm going to help you out with that, understanding that. Just as God did from his. He says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Isn't that interesting, huh? Making an effort to enter rest. Some people think that that's actually heaven, like heaven, that's our rest. That's not heaven. It's not what he's talking about right there. Because you don't make an effort to enter heaven. That was, that was an effort that Jesus exerted on the cross. I don't need to make an effort. It is by grace through faith. 
the rest he's talking about here that we are entering into is a rest in this life. It is the walk with Jesus rest that we are being invited into. Hebrews 4, 3 says, for only we who believe can actually enter that rest. That's it. So, so look, some of you are trying so hard to do good, to do right, to be, da, 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 da. stop trying and start trusting. The moment that you, you stop trusting God, you have, you have removed yourself from rest. See, it's like when you're trying to believe, when you're trying to fix it. You know, when you're, when you're worrying about something, it's usually an indication that you're trying to control something that's out of your control. Right? right? So I, 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 there's something going on, and like, instead of, instead of resting, trusting in God that he is in control, I remove myself from rest, and I try to control it myself. I want to fix it. I want to control it. See, living by faith is not a struggle. It's a rest. And if you're struggling, you're doing it wrong. That's what I'm saying. If you're struggling, you're doing it wrong. It's a, it's a rest. So let me give you a few thoughts today, and then I'm going to help you out with two different rhythms that we're going to start this year. This year, in this way, we are going to enter God's rest. We're going to learn how to sit in his grace. A daily rhythm of a quiet time rest and a weekly Sabbath rest. It's not what you think it is, but I'm going to help you out. We need to, get in, we need to recapture this in Christianity and in our, in our lifestyle, in the model that Jesus invited us into, the unforced rhythm of grace. But let me start with a few thoughts. Here's the first one. You have to actually want to hear from God in order to enter this place. You cannot... You cannot enter this place because it's, it's the ritual, the rule, the, the law. It's like, no, you actually got to really, really want to hear from God. God is not going to give you your dream for your life if you want to debate him about it. He's not going to tell you the vision of your life if you're like, um, I'll see if I got time for it. No, you got to like really want to hear from God. It's got to be a necessity. Like, I've got to know why, God, that I'm here. i got to hear your voice. i got to know your plan. God, i got to hear you. You have to really want. D King David wrote it like this, a few psalms. Psalm 40, verse 8 says, My God, I want to do what you want. That's all I want, God, whatever you want. Psalm 119 and 20 says, What I want most of all and at all times is to honor your laws. See, David was passionate about his declaration to know God and to hear God. That's like, it wasn't an option. It's the only thing. We see him using phrases like, I long for it, I crave it, I hunger it in the Psalms. In one place he says, as the deer pants for the water, so my soul craves after you. See, a lot of people talk to God, but they don't let God talk to them. And it's like a monologue, and that's not a relationship. There is no relationship with a monologue. So we're doing like all the talking, but there is no listening happen. What would that look like if I married Veronica and all I did was talk, but I never listened? I wouldn't be married right now probably, right? right? That's, not, that's not good. You got to really want to hear him. And when you do, when you really want to hear God, you're going to be moved to a place of quiet, of silence, of solitude, to, to hear him in the place of depths where he exists, in that deep place of your soul, of stillness, of of quiet. And when you do that, when you actually, when you really want to, you're going to start seeing him everywhere and hearing him everywhere. It's like, it's like when you want to buy that car and you see everybody like driving that car now, you're like, oh, look at that. There's that car. Oh, everyone's getting my car now after I want it. No. You just, or, or you like, you want some earbuds or something like that. Now you're noticing everybody's wearing them. They got Beats. They got, they got Apple. They got this. You know, all that. And like, it's not like they all just started putting them on. You just started craving for it. All right? And it's, listen, it's not that God is not speaking right now. It's just you haven't been hungry for him until now. And when you start hungering to hear God and to be fed by him and to, and to see him, then you will start noticing him all around you. He's actually speaking. He's actually moving. You just ain't hungry enough. You don't really want it. It's not a dependent. You have to really want to hear God in order to get to this place of Eremos, because it's not a geographical location. It's a place of your soul. It's the depths that I go with God in silence and in solitude. Am I scaring you guys? All right. This, is, this just needs to be recaptured. I'm just trying to, I'm really trying to help this be a different year for you, and I really believe it can. It's accessible. It really is, it, no matter what happens out there. But in here, man, we can get in rhythm. It can be an amazing year. Deuteronomy 4, 29 says, but if from there you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. 
Like, it's got to be all in. I love what Paul said in Philippians 3.10. He says, for my determined purpose is that I may know him, that I may progressively become deeply and intimately acquainted with him. How many of you is that your prayer here today? Come on, are you hungry for God? Do you want to progress in your relationship with God? It's got to be. In order for you to get to this place with God, it's got to be your hunger. you got to really want to hear from him. And then here's like another reason why God wants us to enter, to find a real rest and recover our life. Because it's going to relieve pressure with margin. you got to relieve the pressure of your life with margin. You know what margin is? Margin is having breathing room in your life. It's creating some reserves so you don't get to this place of burnout. So you don't get to the end of yourself again and again and quit again. And, you know, a falter again. It's, you got to have some margin. Margin is the space between my load and my limits. That's the, it's that space between I, I'm carrying a load and I haven't got to the limit of it yet. I need space. I cannot eat up all the space. You need margin in every area of your life. You need physical margin. So you don't wear out, so you don't burn out. You need spiritual margin to defeat temptation in your life. You need emotional margin for your relationships. You, you need a, a financial margin to avoid getting into debt, getting in over your head. You need time margin in your schedule so you're not just in a pace and hurry, hurry, going from one thing to the next thing and drowning by your schedule. You need margin in every area. This is one of the reasons why God invites us into this place of rest because you need margin. In your life. Look at Song of Solomon says. This is some of you guys' life. He says, I had no time to care for myself. And some of you say, yep, that's me right there. I don't have time. Look, it's not that, it's not that you don't have the time. Son, you're not, you're not making time. You got to make the time. And I'm telling you, you need this rhythm. You need the prayer and fasting. That's the first rhythm. You need the silence and solitude. You need a rhythm, a rhythm to care for yourself. Get alone with God. There's actually four stages of burnout. I just want to show them to you. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to preach this at you, but some of you may be here, and this is why you need to recover your life today and follow Jesus' rhythm of, of silence and solitude in that emos. Here's the four stages. Some of you may be in one of these stages. The first stage is physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion. Where some of you are already, already at the beginning of the year, you're like, I'm done. <laughs> are we over? Like, oh my gosh, you're already physically and emotionally and, and mentally exhausted. If you do not get to that place of inner rest, if you don't listen to what's happening there and change your pace and change your rhythm, you'll get to the second stage, which is shame and doubt. You'll feel bad about yourself because you couldn't do it and you didn't do it and you messed it up. Or you doubt like if I'm ever going to. You're just going to be consumed with shame. In doubt. And again, if you don't enter inner rest from there, you're going to get to the, thir the third stage, which is cynicism and callousness. You just get critical. You get critical over yourself, critical over people. You get calloused and hard in your spirit and in your heart. And eventually, if you do not enter rest, you're going to feel like a failure, helpless. And you will come to a place of crisis where something breaks down, either in your body, in your mind, or in a relationship, in your life. A crisis will happen if you do not enter rest rest you get to this place of burnout here's the third one your greatest revelation will actually happen in rest okay think about it think about this like the, the moments when god reveals himself to you when he speaks to your heart when he when he speaks to that inner man inside of you it's not in times when you're running like crazy it's in the quiet still moments of his presence isn't it your greatest revelations come when you are in this place of rest. Hebrews chapter 11, again, let me show you that verse we just read a moment ago and show you what comes after it, verse 12. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. We heard that, but let me show you why. So that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience, talking about Israel. But here's why. For the word of God is alive and active. Do you see that? God says, hey, you need to enter this rest. Make every e e effort to enter this rest because God's word is alive and active. And if you are not in this place where beneath the soil of your heart, beneath the surface of your iceberg, superficial life, if that is not exposed to God's word, then it will not penetrate that soil and bear fruit in your life. If all you are is superficial, the seed's going to stay there. But if I enter this place of rest and I know the voice of God, I know he exists in the deep and I go to that place in my past, my memories, my hurts, my dreams, my purpose, then when the word of God that is a living and active, it goes deep down into my soil. This is what your revelation 
happens in rest. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That's why when you're at rest, when you're not, it stays right there on the surface and you leave here unchanged. And the enemy just plucks the seed. It bears no fruit in our life. Only when you're in the position of inner rest will the seed bear fruit in your life. Will the word of God bear fruit in our life? So what do we do with the rhythm Jesus invites us into? How to, you know, where he says, I'll, I'll show you how to take a real rest. Now, Jesus didn't have some of the distractions that we have today, right? He didn't have social media or Netflix, so I, it's probably easier for him to go to Ed Emos, really easier. We got some, we got some challenges, right? Because there's a lot of stuff that's, that's distracting us and fighting for our time, our energy, and our attention. But it's more than that, isn't it? It's more than just your time, energy, and attention. You see, your attention is actually the key ingredient of devotion, Whatever you're giving your attention to, your energy and focus and attention to, you are devoted to. So, so it's, it's actually these distractions in our life are not just taking attention, energy, and focus. Listen, they're taking your devotion from God. They're taking our devotion. So what do we do? Jesus says in Matthew 6, 6, here's, here's his remedy. Find a quiet, secluded place. Find Hey, child of God, look up here. Find at Emos. Find at Emos in the middle of your distraction, in the middle of your, your busy schedule. You got to find at Emos. Find the quiet. Find the secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. You won't pretend like it's okay. Stay superficial. Everything's okay. Everything's good. Going good. It's great. God bless you. Amen. Everything's good. It won't be role playing. You can't role play in that place of Edemos. No, it's, that's the depths of our soul. Just be there, he says, simply and honestly as you can manage. And if you do that, the focus is going to shift from you and your problems and your issues and your plights. Oh, it's going to shift from there to who God is. And you'll begin to sense his grace. You're not going to sense that grace in the middle of the noise and the distraction. You've got to get away. Here's a key to hearing God speak and getting vision in your life. You've got to understand God wants to meet with you. In fact, you're not waiting on God. God's waiting on you. He wants to spend time with you. Like he wants you to schedule a daily date with him. Like to spend some time, a quiet time is what it's sometimes called. This edemos, the silence and solitude. It's sometimes called a quiet time with God. He wants you to. Getting alone in a quiet place can be difficult. I know. We got a lot of distractions. We got a lot of things going on. Maybe, and there's always noise, right? Maybe you're driving. You always have the radio on. You always got Apple Play or Bluetooth or you always got some, you always got the TV on. Even when you're in an elevator or you're at the grocery store or you're waiting in this a line, there's some music playing. Like every, It's like there's almost no place that we can go where it's just silent. So I understand the the challenge is to getting to an Emos, and especially if you got kids at home, right? How do you get to that place with kids at home? It can be very difficult. Let me give you some hope. There's this woman by the name of Susanna Wesley, one of the great women of history. She actually had 18 children. Susanna Wesley actually was, she was the mother of, of John and Charles Wesley. John was the, the initiator of, of the uh, Methodist church. And Charles Wesley, he wrote over 600 hymns. They were just like amazing men of God, amazing. Um, but she, like, how do you do, how with 18 kids do you have like quiet time with God? How do you find the time for that? In her biography, she actually wrote that what she would do, because she had a small place with 18 kids, she would get on the couch and put her apron over her head. And she'd have an hour of quiet time. And, and her kids would later write that their mother's prayers are what changed their life. Because they would hear her from her quiet place. From, and, and, and the kids know. They knew. They, they wrote. Like they knew. When mom has the apron over her head, you better shut up. You don't, you don't mess with mama. You don't make noise. This is mama's quiet time right, right here. So look, yes, I understand it can be hard to find your eremos. To find that place of silence and solitude in the middle of all the distractions. But if 
Susanna Wesley, with 18 kids and two bedrooms, can put an apron over her head and have a quiet time with God, I think you can find a place to find a daily quiet time of silence and solitude. So here's what I want to do, and I'm going to give it to you rather quickly. So I'm, it, it, this, is the, this is the practical part of the message. I just got you bought in on having some silence and solitude and a rhythm of rest in your life. It's actually something that you need and Jesus invites you into that we're not to pattern ourselves in the culture of this world, the tradition of this world. Man, we're to be different and have a different rhythm and pace, okay? But let me get really practical. How do you, do, how do you develop a daily rhythm of rest? And I'm going to show you how to take a Sabbath rest, like a weekly time with God to rest. Now, the purpose, though, the purpose of a daily rhythm of rest is actually to remember God and commune with him. That's the purpose. Very important for you to understand because you could enter, you could rest physically and emotionally and totally miss God. It's more than that. It's a, yes, we need the margin. Yes, we are going to recharge ourselves emotionally and physically. But, but that's not the purpose. That's the byproduct. The purpose of this eremos is actually to remember God in my life and commune and connect with him. That's the purpose of this daily time. So how do we do it? Let me give you four steps to help you out. We're going to start new rhythm. Amen, somebody? We're going to start a new rhythm with God. First, it starts with stopping. <laughs> there you go. Start by stopping. Just stop. Stop getting ready. Don't, don't, don't get ready while you do your devotion. Okay, stop, stop. Just stop getting ready. You need to stop from the unhurried pace so that we can read, so that we can pray. And what we read and pray has time to sink into the depths of our heart and our soul. See, the reason why most people never hear God speak is that they never stop long enough to let God talk to them. You gotta stop, just stop. Here's what Mark 6, 31, Jesus, it says, then because so many people were coming and going that his disciples didn't have a chance even to eat, he said to them, come with me by yourselves to Eremos, to a quiet place, and get some rest. Now here's the challenge of stopping. The challenge of stopping is actually trusting that God is on the throne. It's, it, it's, it, the challenge is like, he rules and I don't. And if I actually stop and I have some quiet time and a daily rhythm of rest, I, I give up control. That, and I trust that God is going to run the world effectively without me today. And that's hard. Because many of you are trying to run your kids, your spouse, your life. You're, you're trying to keep control. And you weren't meant to live in control. You were meant to surrender control. It's a life of surrender. So here's how we begin this rhythm. Stop and trust that God is actually in control. And he's actually going to do a good job without you today. Or in this, in this 15, 30 minutes or whatever it is that you're going, to, you're going to give to God. And then number two is centering. Stopping, and then I need to center myself. Psalm 37 and 7 says, be still before the Lord and wait patiently before him. So this idea of centering, when we're moving into God's presence and resting there, you don't get to that place like immediately, automatically, or easily. It takes some time. Once you stop, like now I'm still kind of, my mind is still flooded with the tensions and distractions and the stresses of this world. I actually got to spend a few moments right there stopping to center myself. To hear, and this may take a few minutes to just center myself. How do you center, your, center yourself? Let me give you a few thoughts that didn't make it into your notes. If you want to write a few down. Be attentive and open. When you're centering yourself, be attentive to God and open to him. Sit still and sit straight. I'm just giving you some practical help, you guys, to help you. Don't be all leaning up. Don't put your legs up. Don't lay down and try to have a quiet time with God. No. Sit still. Sit straight up and breathe slowly and deeply. In and out. Close your eyes or look down and just center yourself. And your mind starts to wander with your anxieties and distractions, stuff like that. You ask. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you as you breathe. Fill me with your spirit. And as you breathe out, breathe out every distraction and everything that is not of God in your life, every sin, every, just breathe that out and breathe in the Holy Spirit. Center yourself. And then once you get to that place of centering, number three is silence. This is uh, Eremos. Silence is 
one of the most challenging and least practiced rhythms of Jesus. You know why? Because most of us fear the silence. We do. In fact, they've done studies that, that most groups can only handle 15 seconds of silence. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Y'all started freaking out. Like, is he gonna, that'd be weird. That'd be weird right now. It would. It would. We all felt that it would feel weird because it just feels weird to be in a group and silent. But in order to get alone with God, you have to quiet your soul and be silent. This is where God speaks. God speaks in the silence. It's weird, huh? God speaks in the silence. It's actually what happened with Elijah. In 1 Kings chapter 19, after Elijah's suicidal depression and him fleeing Jezebel, and if y'all don't have never read that story, it's actually a real story, 1 Kings chapter 19, you should go read it. Um, he told Elijah to stand and wait in the presence of the Lord, and he's about to pass by. And, and God did not appear to him in ways he had did in the past. See, God wants you to get to this place of silence and stillness and solitude because he has a new thing for you. He's got a new word for you. He's got, a, he's got something new. It's not going to be like the past. Some of you are looking to your past and yesterday's word and last year's victories, and God has a new word for you. And so in that place right there, God didn't appear like he had in the past. He didn't appear in the wind like he did with Job. And he didn't appear in the earthquake like he did at Mount Sinai when he gave the Ten Commandments. He didn't appear in the fire like he did with Moses in the burning bush. He appeared in a new way. He spoke to Elijah in a new way. And it was in this still small voice. Some of your translations say that. Some of your translations say a gentle whisper. But that really doesn't capture the Hebrew word. I mean, what were the translators to do? It was, it's really hard to translate because here's what it literally means. The sound of sheer silence. After the chaos of wind and fire and earthquake, God was there in the silence. I mean, what were the tra- how do you hear silence? Of course the translator is going to have a hard time translating that, but this is where God speaks. In the silence and solitude of Ademos is the voice of God. He exists right there in that deep place. Psalm 62 says, My soul waits in silence for God only, for my hope is from him. He alone, he only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. and I will not be shaken. So I'm just trying to help you guys create this daily rhythm of rest, a quiet time with God where you still yourself long enough to hear. You get to that place of Eremos. And then lastly, number four is Scripture. It's to read, meditate, study, fill your mind, your heart, your soul with the word of God in this place of quiet and stillness. Joshua 1 and 8 says, keep the book, this book of the law, always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. And then he says, when you do that, that's when you're going to be prosperous and successful. Hey, this year is going to be different. Okay, it's countercultural. I get it. I get it. prayer and fasting and actually living a life in rhythm of prayer and fasting is countercultural. This having a rhythm of rest, like daily quiet stillness of an animal is like, what in the world? Yes. And then here's, I'm, not a, I'm inviting you to this rhythm this year, not just a daily quiet time, but how do you have actually a Sabbath rest? You know what a Sabbath is? A Sabbath is somewhere within your seven day period is a 24 hour rest. That's what it means to have a Sabbath. Now, sometimes there's a lot, there's some confusion. Some people are like, well, what, is, what day is, it, is the actual Sabbath day? Yes, in the Old Testament, they celebrated the Sabbath on Saturday. That's the day of the Sabbath. But when Jesus came, he actually um, said, he, he, let me give you a few scriptures. In Mark chapter 2, 27, the, and this is just to help you guys out with understanding Sabbath. It says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, like we were made to rest on the Sabbath. Sabbath wasn't made to like restrict us. In fact, in Colossians chapter 2, it says this. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. He said, don't let anybody judge you on when you're doing a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in walking with Christ. That's what, so, so what is, how do you have a Sabbath today? It doesn't matter the day. It does not matter the day. In fact, ever since Jesus, the time of Jesus' death and resurrection, it's been on Sunday, is when the church has celebrated the Sabbath. Because Jesus rose from the dead on a Sunday, 
Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was, was poured out on a Sunday. And so every, ever since Acts and on, the church is gathered in remembrance of the outpouring of the this, of this Spirit and the resurrection of Jesus on what is called the Lord's Day. So it don't matter, though, like when, you're, when is your day of rest? What you need to do, and what I'm encouraging you to do today that is so countercultural, is to have a rhythm where 20, for 24 hours you rest in your week period. Somewhere is a 24-hour period. What do you do? Let me give you four things real quick. Number one, you're going to stop again. Stop. Now, you think you can't stop because there's always something left unfinished, right? But listen, this is the beauty of Sabbath. Sabbath embraces our limitations. I know I'm not complete. God is in control, and he's God, and the world can continue working fine when I stop. Life on this side of heaven will always be unfinished. And this is the core spiritual issue revolving around stopping is trust. I'm going to stop for 24 hours and trust God. Number two is rest. I'm going to rest from, from work, yeah. From errands, from multitasking, from hurriedness, from worry, from even decision making. I'm going to try not to make a lot of decisions. I'm just going to rest. It's, it's, it can be really hard to have a day of rest because sometimes your day of rest can be the day you get caught up on chores. But that's not a day of rest. Like the Jewish people, they had a, cut, a tradition of actually having a day of preparation before their day of rest. They had to actually prepare to rest because the laundry, I'm going to want to do that laundry. I'm gonna, uh, I didn't go grocery shopping, so I'm going to have to go grocery shopping now. It's my day of rest. No, have a day of preparation so you can actually have a 24-hour rest. What do you do? What do you replace all that work with? Number three, you, pre- you replace it with delight. Whatever, whatever, whatever delights and replenishes you is what you are going to do in your 24-hour period. I know this is countercultural. Some of you think you can't do it. You need to do it. You need to. I promise you, try this. Trust me, try it. Give God a shot. Just see what the rhythms of Jesus can do for your life. Some of you say, well, what delights and replenishes me, though, is work. You know what that, that, no, no, if that's true, which some of you, it, you feel like it's true. If that's true, what that means, though, is that you just don't know how to enter rest. You don't. Because work ain't supposed to be, give you what only Jesus can. It wasn't supposed to give you the delight and the replenishment, to feed you. It wasn't supposed to take you to the depths. In fact, it cannot get you to the place of deep dwelling place of God. The fact that you think that way shows how far you are away from rest how much you actually need it. I love you. Stop. Rest. Delight. And then the most important thing, number four, is commune. It's the whole purpose of my resting, of my stopping, of my eremos, is to actually connect with God, to contemplate. Contemplate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to commune with Him. I'm going to think about Him. I'm going to meditate. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a place of contemplation, deep, cont- quiet, still, Silence. Exodus 33 and 14. And I'm about to close, you guys. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. A mark of the presence of God on your life is rest. Some of you need this rest so bad. Like, you're here today. Before you stir, go. I know I gave you the last feeling, but listen. Some of you are so stressed. You're so hurried. You're so anxious. You're, you're trying to control things around you, and and, and it's not working and you feel it. And God is calling you today to stop. Stop trying and start trusting. Like stop, stop all the trying, stop trying to control it, stop, and just trust God. Give up, surrender, and give it to God. Some of you need to just stop today. Stop. And enter this place of rest. Sit, sit in His grace. Some of you have never done that. Maybe you've been around church, but you've never really sat in grace. You're just trying and trying and trying to be good. Some of you, maybe you've never really accepted this. You've never really stopped and surrendered the control to God ever before. That's what salvation is. This is the invitation. When Jesus says, come, follow me, this is the invitation. Stop trying and let me take it. Stop, stop. You don't have to fix it. I will. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So I want to start with some rest here. Some of y'all need to stop. Can we bow our heads all over this place and online with us all over this place? Would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? Because right now, I think some of you need to stop. You've been trying so hard. You've been running so hard. 
You've been trying to control things. Stop. Rest. Surrender. With every head bowed and eye closed, if you're here today and you've never really stopped and surrendered the control, given it to God, that's what salvation is, and I'd love to pray with you. I'm not going to have you come to the front or single you out, but right here, right now, I'd love to help you with a prayer, a prayer of surrender. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three, and I just want you to lift your hand up if you're ready to stop and give the control to God today. Online, if you're with us, on the count of three, I just want you to type in, I need Jesus. Come on, are you ready to give God control and stop trying to control everything yourself? It's time. One, two, three. Come on, lift it up. I'm stopping right now, God. I'm not in control anymore. I surrender all over this place. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, lift it high. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Amen, amen, amen. Yes, yes, yes. All over. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to stop trying to carry it. You're in control. Put your hands down. Can I help you with a prayer? Let me just help you out right there. Will you just whisper something like this? Jesus, forgive me for my sins and my past. Today I surrender control. And I declare you're my Lord. Come live inside of me and change me. Make me brand new. God, I speak over your people here today. That we would enter into this place of rest. That this week we would practice daily that, that this week we would practice a Sabbath rest and daily rhythms of rest, that we would hear you in the stillness of silence, that you would speak in the deep places of our soul. We thank you for it, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give God some praise if you receive that today. Amen.